Welcome back to ECE 320A. Homework number three, I see the stack accumulating. It's due today. It can be turned into my mailbox in the ECE building if that's preferred by you, and that's on the second floor. You should hopefully be reading chapter 12, which is Laplace Transforms. We are going to continue that material and homework four will be covering that and that is yet to be assigned but I'll try to get that available shortly and that will be due in a week. Today what I want to do is go ahead and answer the question that was asked of your quiz the last time. Here's a series RLC circuit what is the differential equation by scoring the first, I don't know, 12 or 13 of the students in the class. It doesn't look like everyone is acing that particular topic material. So let's quickly go over that. That will give us differential equations. That's in the time domain. What you will probably start learning to like more is the Laplace, working it in the frequency domain because then we can transfer this circuit analysis into an algebra problem instead of having to work with time domain differential equations. But I want you to get comfortable with all of these different aspects, being able to work in the time domain, being able to work in the frequency domain, and going back and forth. We will then pick up with, after we've found that, oh, here's a second order differential equation, which we actually Laplace transformed, Sometimes those equations might contain integrals and we would like to take those into the frequency domain. That's what we will look at next is how do we transform an integral. Then we will look at some more specific signals that you may want to understand how to find their Laplace transforms. We'll look, at, look into some of those. We will talk about some Laplace transform theorems or operational transforms, and then we will probably get into inverse Laplace transforming if we get that far. What I want to do now is look at the RLC circuit from the last lecture, and the question was find a governing differential equation containing the capacitor voltage, which could include the voltage itself and maybe some derivatives, and the source voltage V of T. Sketched, we had that particular circuit, and here I've labeled some of the quantities that might be of interest to us. We have our voltage source V of T, which is yet to be determined or it's unspecified, and we would then need to be told what that is in order to solve this system of equations. Last time I asked how many energy storage devices were present in that circuit, and what did you tell me? There's two. We have an inductor and we have a capacitor. We have two energy storage devices or elements. We would ex be expecting <clears throat> either two first-order differential equations or one second-order differential equations to govern the dynamic behavior of this system. The question was, how do we or please find a differential equation that governs the dynamic behavior of that circuit. Some of you were able to do that, some of you were not, but in general, when you're dealing with RLC circuits and trying to write time domain differential equations, you probably want to focus on two different variables, inductor blank and capacitor blank and you have two choices to fill in those blanks, voltages or currents. So, if I was to write the equation or equations in this system, what would I be focusing on writing the equations with respect to? Inductor current or inductor voltage or capacitor current or capacitor voltage? Okay, so now we want inductor current and capacitor voltage. 
And if you forget those, you could always just remember Eli the Iceman. And write down those governing differential equations, and now you're looking for what variables are these first derivatives. You have Eli, which is V is equal to L di dt. The di dt tells you, oh, you're interested in the time variation of the current. That's the inductor current. So if you have Eli, you have V sub L of t is equal to L di sub L of t dt, and you now want to think about focusing on inductor currents. Similarly, if we had ice, that tells us that our capacitor current, I sub C of T, is C dV sub C of T dT. And that's one way that you could possibly remember what do I focus on when I'm writing governing differential equations in RLC type circuits. We want to now write the equations in terms of inductor currents and capacitor voltages. If that's the case, here is our circuit, and what we naturally might want to do is say, oh, that looks like a mesh. Can I just walk around that mesh or do a KVL? And that's a very logical approach. If we now apply KVL to that circuit, and if we did nothing else, we could simply write it in terms of the voltage drops across each of those elements. We could say, oh, we're going up through the source, entering the negative terminal. We have minus V of T. Then we start hitting all of the positive polarity markings that I've labeled, plus V sub L, plus V sub R, plus V sub C, and then we're back to where we started, and that's now, that sum equals zero. That's KVL. We could say, oh, without getting into anything specifically, we have minus V of T, that was our source, plus the inductor voltage, plus the resistor voltage, plus the capacitor voltage. All of those are functions of time, and that now is our a true statement associated with that series RLC circuit. We've just created a lot of variables, but that's okay. At least we see what's going on. This is just KVL. There's nothing very difficult about that after you've come out of 220. But now what we want to do is we said, well, we want to write these equations in terms of inductor currents and capacitor voltages. Meaning, V sub L I could replace. I know what that is. That's Eli. That's L D I D T. Because the I that I've labeled up above is the inductor current. Is that clear, what I'm trying to do or what I'm saying? V has to be given to us, so we have minus V of T plus L di of T dt. And what's V sub R in terms of inductor currents and capacitor voltages? IR. And I, again, is the same inductor current, and that's what we want. And how do we express the capacitor voltage in terms of capacitor voltages and inductor currents? That well, if you simply write it in terms of capacitor voltages... That's a capacitor voltage. And that is now a true statement that governs the dynamic behavior of that circuit. And in this case, what's the order of that equation, of that differential equation? 
by itself, it has one derivative, doesn't it? So it's first order. And we could solve this for di dt if we wanted to. We have what we will call a state variable, i of t, and we have another state variable, v sub c of t, and we have our given independent source, v of t. But we said we had two energy storage devices in that circuit, and so we were expecting either two first-order differential equations or one second-order differential equation. So far, what we have is one first-order differential equation. We need another differential equation. And that second differential equation needs to involve the source the inductor current and the capacitor voltage. Is there something in this circuit? And this one actually is, because it's too easy, it's hard. <laughs> Meaning, well, I've given you the only equation that it seems like is there, KVL. But the other thing that you can see if you look at this is we have this current I, which is actually the capacitor current also, since everything is in series, and we have our capacitor voltage. We can actually relate those two, rela those two quantities or those two variables by I's. Our second equation then comes to us from ice, and that says that this I sub C of T, which is just I, is equal to C dV sub C dT. And that's our second first order differential equations. Those two coupled first order differential equations govern the dynamic behavior of that circuit in the time domain. That's what we need in order to solve that. And we could put that into a computer. We could put it into MATLAB and play with whatever we want as long as we understand how to create those equations in MATLAB. And that's where we hopefully will get to in this class. We'll describe also how to maybe model that in the frequency domain. Well, we obviously will, but we'll also look at Bode plots. Has anybody heard Bode plots before? Do you know how to create them, build them? What is a Bode plot? Yeah, P spice. By hand. Now you need to get your napkin out and sketch a Bode plot. We're going to be finding transfer functions. In this particular circuit, what we might be interested in is the transfer function relationship between the voltage source and the capacitor voltage. And that will give us a transfer function. We can now sketch the Bode plot associated with that transfer function, and the Bode plot is just a frequency response. How does this circuit behave when hit or when certain frequencies are applied to that circuit? And a Bode plot or a frequency response, think of your graphic equalizer. Oh, I really like my bass. I just heard something going across on Speedway. I was clear inside the mail room in the ECE building. <laughs> I would not want to be the ears in that vehicle. It was going through about three or four different walls, and I still could, I was still in pain. But you can now adjust those knobs to give you a preference on how you want those frequencies to pass through your system. This system now gives us that naturally by the values of R, L, and C. It, adjust, it basically is adjusting this graphic equalizer and tell us, telling us how it's going to respond to certain frequencies between the source, V, and the capacitor voltage, V sub C. Suppose somebody says, ah, I, I, didn't want a two, I didn't want two coupled first order differential equations. I wanted a second order differential equation. Well, you have it, and you can now provide that to them with these two. 
And the way to do that is simply to replace everywhere in the top equation, you replace it with this expression for the inductor current or the capacitor current or the resistor current. And you will end up now with a single second order differential equation. Does everybody see what I'm suggesting that we do? We have now minus V of T plus L. That's DI DT, but we said we're going to get rid of I by C dV sub C DT. So there's L DI DT with I now being replaced with C dV dt, or ice, plus R times I, which is C dV sub C dt, plus V sub C of t equaling zero. We will assume that our R, L's, and C's are not functions of time, and we can pull those outside the derivative operator. In some instances, you may not be able to do that if your capacitor is varying with time or if your inductor might be, but in this case, it's the capacitor that we would have to worry about. If we do that, if we slide that through, C we're assuming as a constant. We now have, and if I reorder this a little bit, I have L, C times the second derivative with respect to time of V sub C of T plus RC, first derivative of the capacitor voltage with respect to time, plus V sub C of T, and that's equal to V of T. And we might put that in standard form by making and uh, we'll talk about monic, but basically monic means you have the highest coefficient in your polynomial set equal to one, mono, monic. In this case, we could divide all terms by LC and normalize the coefficient on our highest derivative to end up with maybe this in more standard form, and we have now the second derivative with respect to time of the capacitor voltage, plus, now we're dividing by LC, so we end up with L over R, dVC dt, plus 1 over LC, V sub C of t, equaling 1 over LC, V of t, and this is now a standard form second-order differential equation that governs the dynamics of that series RLC circuit. And that's what you could have written last time. Questions on that? Let's now, this one doesn't, but you may end up with a integral differential equation, and you may want to take it into the frequency domain. If that's the case, we want to be able to go from the time domain integral into the frequency domain, and we want to know what is the operation that we need in the frequency domain to allow us to go from time domain to frequency domain. Or, what is the Laplace transform of an integral operation. In terms of notation that we've been using, we now are going to Laplace transform this integral from 0 minus to t of f of tau d tau. And we would like to find the Laplace transform in terms of 
Laplace transform of little f of t. So we're looking for an answer that looks like something that might contain a capital F of f. As a reminder, what happened when we Laplace transformed the derivative operation? What did we end up with? If we took the derivative of f of t and said take that into the frequency domain, what would the result be? s times capital F of s, and if we had an initial condition, we would need to subtract that. But if we weren't worried about initial conditions, the derivative operation in the time domain corresponds to a multiplication by s in the frequency domain. How are derivative and integrals related? Sort of the opposites, aren't they? Reciprocal. So now we should anticipate that if we differentiated in the time domain led to a multiplication by s in the frequency domain, if we now integrate in the time domain, what would we anticipate happening in the frequency domain? Now we divide by s. So let's see if we can actually show that. Here we want to now take this integral from 0 minus to infinity. This is our Laplace transform integral. And we need to then put into that, whoops, the term that we wish to Laplace transform, which is this integral from 0 minus to, to t of f of tau. And trying to keep my t's and tau's and s's straight, this is now e to the minus st dt. The integral of f of tau is going to be a function of little t. That's a time domain expression. We now scale that or weight that by this complex exponential, e to the minus st, and integrate that over all time from 0 to infinity. We're collapsing all of that time domain information into a frequency domain entity or quantity. Like we have done before, now we can simply start integrating this by parts to try to isolate some expression that looks like the Laplace transform of f of t or f of tau. So if we integrate by parts, suppose that I let f of t, or I'm sorry, v of t equal this integral from 0 minus to t of f of tau d tau. And dw is what's left over. Inside the integrand, now we can say that dv, if I differentiate the integral, That simply leaves me with, whoops, f of t dt, and now if I integrate dw, I have omega of t equaling minus 1 over s e to the minus st. That now allows me, so that I've now identified this V piece, and let's say this W piece, and now I need to integrate by parts. That's going to be this integral. Well, it's V, which is the integral from 0 minus to T, F of tau d tau times w, which is minus 1 over s e to the minus st. So that's vw, evaluated at the two x limits, 0 minus and infinity. And then I need to subtract from that the integral from 0 minus to infinity of w dv. So I now have dv, I'll split that up, there's part of it, then I have this minus 1 over s e to the minus st dt. Those two terms 
now constitute my integration by parts. And that rightmost term is looking somewhat nice. Now I see that I have an f of t, e to the minus st, floating around, or will. I need to evaluate the left-hand term at the two limits. I have minus 1 over s, e to the minus s infinity, integral from 0 minus to infinity, f of tau d tau, minus a minus sign, so plus 1 over s, e to the minus s t, integral from 0 minus to 0 minus, f of tau d tau. That's the first term evaluated at the upper and lower limits of integration. If f of t or f of tau is well behaved, that integral on the first term is okay, and now we simply can say, well, this guy, what's going to happen there? e to the minus infinity, that's going to go away. That's going to dominate. And over here, when we integrate between 0 minus and 0 minus, which means we're not integrating over any length, what do we have? This piece goes to 0, and we're now left with this second half, which is now minus a minus plus, and let me pull the s out in front of the integral since the integral is with respect to time. S is independent of that, and I now have 0 minus to infinity f of t e to the minus st dt. And that should look very familiar to us. This piece is what we had used to define the Laplace transform of a time domain signal f of t. Meaning, we now, when we Laplace transform the integral, we have the Laplace transform of the waveform, capital F of S, divided by S. And that's what we wanted to end up with, based on, and now we don't have to worry about initial conditions in the integral. We simply need to divide by s. If we have the integral or multiple integrals, if we had the double integral of f of t, we would have capital F of s divided by s squared. Questions on that? Now if we have an integral differential equation, meaning a differential equation that has integrals and derivatives, we now know how to Laplace transform it take it from the time domain into the frequency domain. Because we know how to transform integrals and we know how to transform derivatives. We can just keep stacking them up. Question? The question was, what do I want you guys to be using for values for, let's say, the lower limit of the integral in all of these Laplace transforms. I want you to go ahead and put that little minus there so that you're aware that you're trying to start. You're including all of zero. Nothing is happening across to zero that you're not capturing. So you want to be on the leftmost side. Go ahead and try to remember to put that zero minus in that to designate we are on the leftmost side of zero. That's what that's meaning. We want to pick up everything. And that's important because when we deal with the next piece, which is an impulse, if we were sloppy with where we were drawing that line or saying where we're integrating with respect to, we could maybe fall to the right of the impulse and not pick up what it's producing. So we want to always be to the left of the origin so that we can capture what might occur or what might happen at t equals zero. So let's look at the Laplace 
of the impulse. Now, here's where you can get confused. What was the integral? Or what am I thinking the integral was that we just Laplace transformed? I'm viewing that as an operation. That's not a waveform. That was an operation or an operator in the continuous time setting. That integral needed something as its integrand in order to work on it. So it's an operator. Now we are looking at Laplace transforming a signal and a specific signal that is, which is the impulse. So you can apply this Laplace transform to signals and to systems. And that's why you want to be able to do it so that you feel comfortable in the next class, ECE 340, which is sort of entitled Signals and Systems. Or that's what a lot of textbooks are entitled for that class, or could be titled. What do we know about the impulse? It's a special beast. What if I did the following? What if I integrated the product of an impulse with some generic function f of t that I'm going to say is continuous at the origin or at t equals zero. What's the result of this integration? I now start at the south pole and integrate all the way up to the north pole in time effectively. Minus infinity all the way to plus infinity. I have an impulse and what is this impulse? It, it's sharp, isn't it? Very pointed. That's how you sketch it. It has, how much width does it have? What's its support region? Infinitesimal, isn't it? How high is it? You can't even get there, can you? It's infinite. But what do we know about the area of that impulse? That's the key thing. It's one. So if we integrated underneath the, if we integrated the impulse, if we ever captured it, if it ever fell between our limits of integration and we only had the impulse, we would say, oh, we've captured the area underneath that impulse and it's one. That's the weight that we assign to the impulse. If we say, oh, you have an impulse with a weight of two, now you're saying, oh, the area underneath that impulse is 2, 2 delta of t. Now, if we use this magical waveform, this distribution, this delta of t, and we use it to multiply a waveform f of t, what's going to happen when we integrate that? it's going to pull off this function, f of t, it's going to pull off only what its value is right at the point when that impulse is active. In this case, the impulse is active when its argument is equal to zero. The argument is just t. So the impulse is operating or working right at t equals zero which means that what's going to happen under here is it's going to hit f of t, it's going to capture it right at t equals zero and weight it by one and produce then just the value of that function f at time zero. What happens now if we do something else? And somebody says, oh, okay, here, I'll throw you a little bit different beast. And they say, what's that integral? It's similar in understanding to what's up above. It's just now, when is that impulse turned on or active? when its argument is zero, when t minus t naught is zero, or when time is equal to t naught. Everybody see that? 
So if we were drawing this impulse on the independent time axis, where would we draw this arrow? At t0, t sub 0. So now we're looking at f of t and saying only at t equal t sub 0 is where we're going to see it. And it's going to be weighted by a value of 1. And those are the two ideas or concepts that are important to know in order to find the Laplace transform of the impulse. Let's now look at the Laplace transform of the impulse. Once you feel okay with these expressions, it's not difficult to find the Laplace transform of this impulse. It's defined as this integral from 0 minus to infinity of the waveform that we are Laplace transforming, which in this case is delta of t, the impulse. We weight it by this complex exponential and integrate over all time. And if we now apply what we just were talking about up above to this integral, we need to evaluate the integrand, whatever's left over when we take away the impulse. We evaluate that integrand where that impulse is active. In this case, the impulse is active at zero. Or we now have the Laplace transform of the impulse is simply one. And you could call this Do we have any bakers in the audience? Have you ever heard of a sifting machine? Or do you have a sifter? I think I actually, I one time it may have been in another class, but we were talking about sifting and they brought a sifter into the final exam. They said, Dr. Tharp. I said, okay, you can use it on the final. Their paper had a little flower on it, but I didn't deduct any points for that. But if you've ever had, typically now you buy your flour and it's pre-sifted if you look on the package. So you look at that package and it goes, oh, it's pre-sifted. But what are you doing? Now whenever you think of, if you're baking cookies or something, you'll go, oh, the impulse response. Somebody's going to go, what are you talking about? Oh, it's a, it has a sifting property when you put it inside an integral. Let's now... Now when you go home, you can start talking about baking and you can say, what's the Laplace transform of an impulse? I don't know, but those chocolate chip cookies sure smell good, right? All right, let's look at the Laplace transform of sinusoids. And before we do that, or to create that, or to make this easier, let's look at Laplace transforming an exponential, where gamma could be a complex variable. In terms of the definition, we are integrating time out of this. So we're integrating from t equals 0 minus up to infinity. The waveform, e to the gamma t, e to the minus st, we weight it by this complex exponential and we evaluate or we integrate over all time. We can now rewrite that and we can say, well, let's just combine those exponentials, since that will make our life a little easier. Suppose that I now say e to the minus s minus gamma t dt. What's that integral? s and gamma are independent of time. So if you wanted to, if you felt comfortable with e to the minus alpha t, 
If you can integrate that, you can integrate this. Alpha now is S minus gamma. We have minus 1 over S minus gamma e to the minus S minus gamma of t evaluated at 0 minus and infinity. What happens when t is infinity? We get 0. It's going to dominate everything. And now we have this minus a minus 1 over s minus gamma. That is what we were saying was the Laplace transform of this e to the gamma t. Now that we have that, so let's, let's build up a table. Here's gamma. Here's e to the gamma t. And then here is the Laplace transform of that quantity. Suppose that I select my gamma to be real. Where sigma is positive, so minus sigma is like an e to the minus 2t. What's e to the minus 2t look like as a waveform? Looking from left to right, that's just going to be this exponential decay. That's what this first row is representing. Exponentially damped waveforms. We now have an e to the minus sigma t. Again, sigma is positive. And based on the description above, what do we know the Laplace transform is? We replace gamma with minus sigma, and so we now have 1 over s plus sigma. So if we have a decaying exponential, its Laplace transform is going to be this 1 over s plus sigma, where sigma is the decay. What about if I plugged in where j is the square root of minus 1? I now have e to the j omega t, which when you see that, what do you see? e to the j omega t. What do you start thinking of? A circle. Do you see sines and cosines? You should be seeing sines and cosines with a frequency of omega. Somebody gives you this complex exponential, e to the j omega t, you could be think and you could think of, oh, it's this sort of phasor quantity that's just circling the origin, and it's doing that at a angular frequency of omega. And if I take a picture of that, I can see the real part and the imaginary part, or sines and cosines, if I project it on the appropriate axes. But in terms of what we want to do, what's that give us for our Laplace transform of that complex exponential? Gamma was just j omega, and we had minus gamma before, so we now have 1 over s minus j omega. What about minus j omega? Now we have e to the minus j omega t. Now we're wrapping around in the other direction, but we can still project it. We now have sines and cosines of the same frequency. We now have s plus j omega. And to simply complete this table, Let's go ahead and look at sigma, where again, sigma is positive. Now we have growing exponentials, but we can still Laplace transform these unbounded waveforms. They're simply growing exponentially. 
and that now gives us this 1 over S minus sigma. Now we can find the Laplace transforms that we were wanting, and in particular, suppose I look at the Laplace transform of the cosine of omega t. What I want to do is simply rewrite cosine omega t as a combination of complex exponentials. And if you remember Euler, you can do that, or you can simply say, oh, the cosine of omega t is e to the j omega t plus e to the minus j omega t divided by 2. Or we now have this is equal to 1 half the Laplace transform of e to the j omega t plus one-half Laplace transform of e to the minus j omega t. And now we can use our table values, and we can say that the Laplace transform of this cosine of frequency omega t is one-half over s minus j omega plus one-half over s plus j omega. And if we combine that, downstairs, if we multiply that out, the imaginary pieces go away, they cancel, and we're left with S squared minus j squared omega squared, but j squared is minus 1, so we end up with plus omega squared. What happens up top? We just get a couple of one-half s's, don't we? The imaginary parts cancel each other out, and we simply have s. So that now we have s over s squared plus omega squared, and what fact did we actually use to create that transform? We used this superposition property that said, oh, if we know the Laplace transform independently of f1 and f2, we can combine those to obtain their sum. Laplace transform. Question? What about the case where S is J omega? So now you're, oh, you mean when you evaluate it in the transform? So now what the question was, I believe, is what if we examine this transform, which is the Laplace transform of a cosine, what if we evaluate it at s equal j omega? We get some music. <laughs> yes? Did you hear that? So we get music. When you evaluate this cosines, and what was the frequency of that music? Omega, right? What we will eventually do is we'll start looking at these transforms or these ratios of polynomials of S and start saying zeros and poles. The zeros are the values of S where the numerator vanishes. Those are the finite zeros. And we have finite poles those are values of finite or finite values of s that cause the denominator to vanish. So what's going to happen is that's going to basically go unbounded right at s equal to j omega. We actually have a pole right on the imaginary axis. So that's what happens when we transform a cosine or when we have a cosine. We've now
in thinking about it, if you view this complex S-plane, if that was a signal, you now have poles right at J omega. And we'll start, hopefully that will start to make a little bit more sense than just me telling you. So you'll start to get a better feel for that as we move through this class. But right now, yes, this goes unbounded when S is equal to J omega. That simply means the denominator vanished at that value of S, which means by definition that's a pole location. That pole is both at J omega and minus J omega. They, those appear in conjugate pairs. If we have something in the upper half plane, we're going to have its twin in the bottom half plane. We're going to have conjugate pairs. Does that help answer your question? So we'll get more, we'll start to feel more about or start thinking, but in, in terms of a picture, we are going to, you'll just love to sketch because now you're going to have what we call poles. And this might be at J omega, and this is minus J omega. And where is the zero in that transform? It's when S is equal to zero. There's our zero. That's the pole zero pattern for the cosines Laplace transform. And you guys just look like you want to learn about the circus. So... What? What do you think of when you think of the circus? The big top tent, right? You now have this tent, big top tent, and what's holding that tent up? Be serious. <laughs> we have poles, right? We have poles holding that top up. So now think of this X as having an infinitely tall pole. Think of this X as having, at the bottom, having an infinitely tall pole. This zero is now a thumbtack, where we stretch this rubberized sheet over this complex S-plane. This is the complex S-plane, if you didn't know. I didn't label it, did I? So this is the S-plane. This is the real part. I'm kind of getting off on a tangent, but we'll... And this is the imaginary axis. So here's our real axis, here's our imaginary axis. We want to know what does that big top tent look like if we were walking underneath it on the imaginary axis. Where it is is actually going to be the magnitude of our frequency response. What does that mean? Well, if this was a system, if we had a system that had these two poles and a zero, and then if we excited it with a cosine of exactly that same frequency, we're going to have an unbounded response. We would hit resonance, because that's going off to infinity. Now we'll get more into that. That's sort of an aside, but the, this is a pole zero pattern. But now we've got cookies, we've got clowns, we've got circus tents, we've got poles, we have zeros. This was just a pleasure-packed lecture, wasn't it? And it's all from Laplace transforming a cosine. Just think what's going to happen when we have exponential, exponentially damped sines and cosines. We're really going to have fun. But what is, well, never mind. We'll, we'll pick up, we'll, we have to leave some things for later. What happens when we Laplace transform a sign? We can do exactly the same analysis. Except now we have to divide by 2j j being the square root of minus 1, and this is now the Laplace transform of e to the minus j omega t. Which, if we pull all of that together, we have 1 over 2j, and then we have s plus j omega minus s minus 
J omega all over And what do we get up top? The S's cancel, and we have two J omegas. So the two J's were those blue J. Never mind. So we have two J omega upstairs, and we have two J downstairs. Those cancel, and we're left simply with omega over S squared plus omega squared. That's the Laplace transform of a sine, a pure sine of frequency omega. So that if you have a sinusoid of frequency omega, you know the denominator better be s squared plus omega squared, whether it's a cosine or a sine. Where are the zeros? Where are your finite zeros in this sine expression? you have no finite zeros. Now your pole zero pattern simply has these two poles. You have no thumbtack anywhere in your complex plane. So there is a difference between cosine and sine, but they will have exactly the same denominator. What if we now said, okay, let's look at the Laplace transform of another waveform, and in particular, Suppose we want a rectangular pulse, meaning what if I have a time domain signal, Z of T, that is a particular width that has an amplitude of A. It basically turns on at T sub 1 and it turns off at T sub 2. And I want to now Laplace transform that pulse, this rectangular waveform. Can you see that I can actually create this pulse out of some unit steps? If I turn on a unit step at time t1, I have an amplitude. If I scaled it by a, I would have something that went forever. But if I turn it off at T sub 2, then I'm just left with this pulse. And that's what I want to do. I want to simply say, because I know how to Laplace transform unit steps, I'm going to say, suppose that I have Z1 and Z2, where Z1 looks like that, and Z2 looks like that. And now all I have to do, because of the linearity property of Laplace transforms, I know the unit steps Laplace transform. Did we derive that last time? I think we did, didn't we? It was 1 over s. Didn't we derive that last time? The transform of the unit step is 1 over s. And what happens when we delay that unit step? Now we have the Laplace transform of z of t is now the Laplace transform of z sub 1 of t minus Laplace transform of z sub 2 of t. Since I need to take z sub 2 away from z sub 1 to cancel everything after t sub 2. But z sub 1 is a delayed unit step. We know that the unit step Laplace transform looks like 1 over s. We have an amplitude of a. Do I need to scale that by anything? What happened when we shifted a waveform when we said f of t minus t naught. Then we had to do an e to the minus s t naught, didn't we? So we now need to scale this by an e to the minus s. In our case, it was t sub 1. 
minus e to the minus s t sub 2, 1 over s a. Or, if we put all of these pieces together, we have the amplitude a, we have a common denominator of s, and upstairs we have an e to the minus s t1 minus an e to the minus s t sub 2. And that's now the Laplace transform of a rectangular pulse. It looks sort of like a unit step, which is where we get the 1 over s from. It's a constant for a while, but it gets turned on and turned off. It gets turned on at t1, gets turned off at t2, and that gives us our difference of those two e to the minus s t terms, and it had an amplitude of a. Question on that. So now we know how to Laplace transform a lot of typical signals. Impulses, unit step, sines and cosines, pulses. What we want to be able to do is maybe even Laplace transform more things, but in order to transform more things, why don't we just build up these more things from basic theorems or basic ideas? So let's look at some Laplace transform theorems or what you might have in the textbook being called these operational transforms. What we will do is we are going to suppose in all of this discussion that f of t has a Laplace transform of f of s, capital F of s, and if we had the Laplace transform, capital F of s, because we're dealing with one-sided Laplace transforms, these are unique, and we can go back to the time domain and obtain little f of t. So that's what we are going to assume. Now, the first theorem that we will talk about is, I got you all excited about sifting, now you need to put an H in there, shifting. So now we're shifting theorem. Suppose we now have, and I think we already talked about this, what's the Laplace transform of this? That we already derived, I believe. What's, suppose now I give you an example, and maybe this will be an in-class participation, because why don't you just keep these on the side of your paper, and I want this to be true for all t bigger than tau. So now I have a one-sided cosine waveform, and I want you to find the Laplace transform of this cosine waveform. So if I said, if I called this g of t, and it's zero for all t less than tau, I want to know what is capital G of S. That's the in-class participation. 
I needed to give you an in-class participation so that I could change out the battery. All right, now we're ready. What did you get? Or what's the Laplace transform of a cosine? A circus tent, right? It's an S over S squared plus omega. So if we didn't have that time delay of tau, we would be fine. Yes? Simply the Laplace transform And that would give you a few points if you just wrote that down on an exam. But what else do we know? We know that we have a delay in the time domain or a shift in the time variable, and that delay is tau units of time. And our theorem that we just talked about said, oh, if you have a time delay of tau units of time, you simply need to scale your Laplace transform by e to the minus s, that time delay. So the only thing we have to do to correct this or to make it accurate is scale it by e to the minus s tau because our delay was tau length of time. Questions on that? What if I said, give me the Laplace transform, let's say h of t is now cosine of 4t minus 6 u of t minus 1.5. What's h of s? Again, in class participation. Pardon? Using my heavy side, yes, I'm using a unit step. So U of T is, the, it's acting like a switch. This is saying, turn this sine wave on, in this sinusoid, turn this sinusoid on after what time? 1.5. So now, if I didn't have it switched on, I would have this infinite duration. It's still infinite duration, but it's only the right-hand side of that infinite duration with that switch or with that M unit step switching it on. But if I didn't have that unit step, I would have cosines going in minus from minus left, minus infinity, all the way to plus infinity. But we are deriving all of our Laplace transforms for one-sided time domain waveforms. We have to draw the line in the sand and say, you're only non-zero for a certain amount of time starting at this point. Everybody got it? What if we simply changed that up and said, oh, well, I, and what did I say in this class? If you don't know how to do something, try to simplify it. Try to change it and get started. What would be an easy way to change this? It might be to say, well, I know how to do this. If he had given me cosine of 4t, and let me just say that's for positive time, u of t, what would this Laplace transform look like? 
is there a 1 over s term in there? So this is now where we need to get comfortable with this piece acting like a switch. So what's actually happening? I have now, please bear with me, this sketch is going to be probably very ugly, but let's just say that we have a cosine waveform, and that's not a cosine, but bear with me. And now we are multiplying that point for point in time by this waveform, which is actually zero here, and then it turns on at t equals zero. What that's doing is it's switching on that waveform for positive values of time. That's what that U of T is doing. So you don't have to explicitly Laplace transform those two pieces because that's really not what you want to do. What we want to do is view this U of T as if it were a switch, and this now says, oh, this is cosine of 4T for T greater than or equal to zero, and it's zero for t less than zero. That's the same thing. So if it's not making sense to you, I would write it in that form. I would say, well, this is really sort of a function that has two different parts. The one part's true for positive or non-negative values of time. The other part is true for negative values of time. It's zero for negative t, and it has cosine of 4t, for t greater than zero. And that's what we've derived our Laplace transform of a cosine for, for one sided sequence or one sided waveforms. This is now our unit step. Is that clear what that's doing? Multiplying a waveform by a unit step? Now, if we multiplied, what did we have? We now said that we had an h of t. That was, where was it? Cosine of 4t minus 6 u of t minus 1.5. Well, what that's saying is this is only going to be non-zero for values of t greater than 1.5. And we could also, I judiciously selected the delay because what we really need to do is factor out that 4 from both pieces in the argument or both terms in the argument of our cosine waveforms. And now I have exactly what I had before, except everything gets shifted by one and a half units of time. And I know how to handle a shift. That's just a scaling by this e to the minus s t naught, where t naught is the amount of delay. If you had an advance, you would have a negative t naught. You would be saying e to the s five if you had an e u of t plus five for example. Is that clear? In this case, what's our h of s? We now have h of s is equal to s over s squared plus 16, or 4 squared, and we need to scale that by this e to the minus s t naught, where t naught is 1.5. Yes, question? Oh, so what happens if those 1.5s weren't equal to each other? Exam number two. So think about that. We're out of time, and I know I, I've just filled you with so much excitement today with circus tents and clowns and poles and zeros, sines and cosines. See what you would do if those weren't quite right. I think you know what I mean. If you now have... Cosine of 4t minus 7 times u of t minus 1.5. See if you can figure that one out, and we'll talk about that on Thursday.